Welcome to the Wine Math series. My name is Maureen Maroney, and in this video, we'll be going through some math related to fermentation tracking. If you would like to skip the detailed explanation and head straight to an example, you can use the time points listed in the video description below. Let's get started. Typically, when we're talking about fermentation tracking, we're talking about measuring bricks and temperature on our fermentations, and we're looking at how those values are changing over time. So those are our three pieces of information that we're working with. Bricks, temperature, and time. Just a quick bit of terminology. You'll see me use this delta symbol sometimes in this video, which indicates a change in value or a difference between two values. We see this used most often with a change in value over time, and we often show it on a graph with time on the x-axis on the bottom. This type of change over time is also commonly called a rate. So we can express rate as the change in bricks over the change in time, or as the change in temperature over the change in time. So for example, if you have bricks on your y-axis going up the y-axis, then we typically start high and then as we go forward in time it starts to drop and then it levels off so it starts high and drops low as time progresses and then similarly if we look at temperature over time usually what we're looking at is sort of starting low and then as the fermentation gets going and time is going onward it goes up and then we'll uh, start gradually start to lose heat as the fermentation slows back down so that's our progression in the change of temperature over the change in time when we look at things graphically like this rate is also known as slope where a sharper slope indicates a faster rate of change and a more gradual slope indicates a slower rate of change. So let's look at, at an example of a fermentation that starts at 24 bricks and eight days later it's reached negative one bricks. If we just use that start and end point, we end up with a straight line with a constant slope or a constant rate of change. We can calculate that rate of change as the change in bricks over the change in time. And if we do that calculation as shown up here, we have a difference of 26 bricks over 192 hours. So 26 divided by 192 is 0 0.14 bricks per hour. But our fermentation curves don't usually look like this. And we usually don't wait eight days between bricks checks. Instead, if we check bricks, let's say once a day, our curve might look something more like this one. And so, depending on which segment we're looking at, we can visually see that the slope is steeper in some places than in others, indicating that the rate of change is faster there. And in the parts where it's changing the fastest, 
we know that even there, it's probably not really a straight line. So if we want better detail, we might have to check maybe twice a day. So again, depending on which segment we choose, we have different slopes and we can calculate our rate as something like um, two bricks over 24 hours or something like 10 bricks over 12 hours. One thing to note when we're talking about time is that on the previous graphs, time was shown cumulatively across the x-axis on the bottom. So we saw the progression from 24 hours to 48 hours and so on up to 192 hours or however long the fermentation takes. But when we're doing bricks checks day to day, we're not recording the date and time as for example, 72 hours post inoculation or whatever. Instead, we're recording the current date and time. And if we want to calculate the rate of the change in bricks, we're just calculating from the previous measurement. So this is why it's important to include the time that the measurement was taken. But it's also worth noting that it can be really helpful to use 24 hour time format for quick calculations. For example, if I check bricks at 8.30 a.m., Let's say I get 17.5 degrees bricks. And then again at 3.30 p.m. and I get 14 degrees bricks. If I express that time as 15.30 instead, then it's easy to see that there were seven hours between checks and my rate is 3.5 degrees bricks over seven hours or 0 0.5 degrees bricks per hour. So why do we care so much about rate calculations anyway? The first reason is because if a nutrient addition is required, it's typically recommended to make that addition at one third bricks depletion. So if you have a must starting at, let's say 24 degrees bricks, one third of that is eight bricks and 24 minus eight is 16. So if you're targeting an addition at 16 bricks, you're essentially trying to predict when that will happen. And we know that our bricks curve doesn't usually look like this. We also know that in the sharpest parts of the curve, when the rate is changing the fastest, the more often we need to be checking in order to get an accurate picture of what's happening. The second reason we care about fermentation rates is because the faster the fermentation goes, the more heat is generated and too much heat can kill or stress out the yeast, which can lead to sluggish, stinky, or stuck fermentations. So when we check bricks, we usually also check temperature to make sure we're not approaching the danger zone of about 100 degrees Fahrenheit or about 40 degrees Celsius. If we look at our BRICS curve compared to our temperature cur curve, we usually see that temperature measurement peaks as the fermentation is going at its fastest rate, the steepest part of the slope. So it often looks something like this. When it comes to figuring out the risk of overheating, we need to consider a few factors. In terms of generating heat, we need to know the current bricks because that sugar is converted to three main things. Ethanol, carbon dioxide, and heat. We need to know the current temperature as our starting point. It's helpful to know how fast the fermentation is going, and we can also think about our rate of temperature change relative to both 
our change in bricks, and our change in time. When the fermentation is going at its fastest rate, heat is generated much faster than it can be dissipated. So the way that heat is dissipated or stored by the fermentation also matters. A larger fermentation in a closed vessel will, re will retain more heat than a smaller open top fermentation. And cap management activities like pump overs and punch downs can also help dissipate heat, as well as homogenizing it throughout the must rather than letting it concentrate in a hot spot. Because of these variables related to dissipating or storing heat, there's no hard and fast rule about how many degrees bricks will cause a given change in temperature in the fermentation. However, a good general guideline is that high bricks, representing a lot of potential energy, is okay if temperature is low, and that relatively high temperature, under 35 to 38 degrees Celsius or so, is okay if bricks is low, but high remaining bricks and high temperature means high risk of overheating. You can think of it as a balance where bricks is potential heat and temperature is actual heat. One is decreasing as the other is increasing and added together, they need to stay under a certain danger threshold. Since we've talked about the change in bricks over time, we can also talk about something else that changes as bricks changes, which is alcohol. There's a video in this series that looks at potential alcohol and discusses the conversion rate of sugar to alcohol. So please check that video out as well. We typically use a ballpark conversion estimate when calculating potential alcohol, but that rate will vary depending on things like the yeast strain, the fermentation vessel, and the chemistry of the must. If you're interested in knowing a more precise conversion rate, you can calculate it based on your own observations in the cellar. If I typically use two different strains of yeast, red and blue, and I know my starting bricks and ending alcohol for each lot of wine, I can go through and calculate the conversion rates. Over time, I can see the ranges and the averages for each yeast. My other factors like vessel size or high bricks must might come into play, so I can also make note of those, especially for any outlier values. And bringing this full circle back to our terminology around rates, a conversion rate for sugar to alcohol is just the change in one value relative to the change in another value. We can look at it graphically and calculate our slope by setting up a fraction like this. for a rate of 0 0.55. Thanks for watching this wine math video. If you have any questions regarding the math or the general wine topic covered, feel free to reach out to us at wine at iastate.edu. Check out the other wine math videos to improve your math skills in the cellar. Cheers.